Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Making Waves with Wet podcast. In every episode, you'll get a glimpse into the latest news, insights, and the real people who are making waves in the wastewater industry. Plus, you'll hear the stories and some of the behind the scenes secrets about how wet comes together. So thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. Hi everyone, this is Liz Bothwell from WET with Brady Skaggs. He's Water Quality Program Director from the Ponchu Train Conservancy. Hi Brady, welcome and thanks for being on the show today. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. So could you tell me a little bit about your background and your journey to being the Water Quality Program Director there? That is a fun one. I I guess it's... um... Well, as I mentioned, uh, I'm not originally from here. So, uh, you know, usually folks from New Orleans, when you're asked the question, where did you go to school? They mean high school. I can never answer that question because I didn't attend high school here. But uh, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, Um, went to do my undergrad at Georgia Tech, Uh, grew up swimming, Uh, had the opportunity and um, really a fantastic time swimming for the university. And then after graduating, I realized, oh my gosh, there's nothing more I can do with swimming because uh, swimming doesn't pay. (laughs) And I decided to pursue graduate school. Uh, And I came here to uh, Tulane where I studied underneath a professor that um, was both a former swimmer and um, was also interested in, in kind of the intersection of, of public health and engineering. And so I got to study water chemistry, uh, specifically as it relates to disinfection technologies. But that's, that's what got me here to New Orleans. Um, and my family, like I mentioned, is, is also from here. So it's some overlapping things, but uh, there was certainly a, a big pull to come here. And all of this happened uh, three days before Katrina. So I was supposed to start school just before uh, Hurricane Katrina made landfall. Oh, wow. What what a start for you. Yeah, that was uh, that was quite a quite a couple of months. So were you delayed in, in classes and work and everything else? I mean, I can only imagine what was happening during those early days. I, I did. So, uh, you know, I moved everything over here. I was kind of ready to go. Um, the storm happened and I wound up needing a place to stay. So I, I managed to um, live on my brother's couch uh, for three months in Tallahassee before classes resumed in, in January of 2006. Wow, crazy. Well, you saw quite a bit. And I mean, talk about a front row seat to all the coastal issues happening down there. And I know that there is a coastal crisis there. Can you just give a little background on that and and tell me more about that and the work you're doing to help combat that? Well, our coastal sustainability program is is certainly working to to combat a lot of those issues. But in short, we have levied the Mississippi River to protect uh, people and property across southeast Louisiana. Uh, the levying of the Mississippi River also allows for kind of maintenance of the waterway uh, related to uh, navigation. But that process has interrupted the natural deposition of, of sediment into the wetlands. So we uh, have historically and currently are certainly combating uh, wetland loss and those issues. And and we're looking for ways to implement, uh, hopefully, projects that will restore a lot of that wetland to southeast Louisiana. Gotcha. I know that you do a lot of work around pollution and you track uh, some of that. Can you talk about what's happening in the waterways there, what what the pollution is, um, where it comes from? Yes. So in the water quality program, there's a variety of things that that we're working on. One is a routine or a long-term monitoring program. Uh, That monitoring program has been going on for the last 20 years. So it was started in 2001. uh, So it's a really robust data set where we conduct weekly sampling. And it's been interesting to collect data 
to be able to view that over the context of time. Um, that program allows us to do other cool things, uh, try to address sources of pollution. So on the South Shore, uh, namely Jefferson Parish and Orleans Parish, we're concerned with stormwater contamination or contact uh, with sanitary sewer um, contributions uh, or, or anything that can result in, in drainage going into Lake Pontchartrain that's, that's been contaminated. On the North Shore, we have a lot of on-site wastewater systems um, that are exempt from EPA or uh, Clean Water Act requirements. Uh, so we provide the service of inspection and also um, data collection and, and the service of helping folks understand their systems so that they can get them uh, performing optimally again. Um, so uh, we do a variety of things to, to try to track pollution sources, but um, unfortunately, because we don't have a lot of sewerage on the North Shore or infrastructure on the North Shore to support uh, a centralized wastewater treatment process, we do a lot of effort to to try to mitigate a lot of on-site wastewater treatment sources. Gotcha. And do I mean, do you think it would be helpful to, for this area to be more tied into, um, you know, a a water treatment facility that's more regulated? How do you feel about that? I mean, I know it, people go back and forth on on what should be regulated and what shouldn't. You know, that's a really interesting question. Um, we certainly hear a lot about how, you know, we don't need more uh, regulation. We, we don't want to be burdened by any more requirements. There are certainly some folks that are, that are, that are very against any additional burden. And I, and I get that. It's certainly something that you can empathize with. However, what we try to communicate or some of the things we try to do is to be advocates for centralized wastewater treatment. Uh, anything where you have wastewater going to a centralized treatment source and get folks out of the business of being their own wastewater operator. Uh, you know, I, it's, it's a long day some days at work. I don't wanna go home and fiddle with a wastewater treatment process. And I think a lot of other people don't either. Um, but what we have to try to do is to bring the message of all these hidden costs and benefits associated with not being tied into a community wastewater treatment system. Uh, and that's that's part of the that's part of the thing. It, it's it's more getting folks to understand, you know, what their costs are or what they're not benefiting from uh, rather than pushing them towards regulation. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So, I mean, for the actual uh, pollutants in the water is it is it more residential sewage or or is it agricultural is it both well we certainly have it, at least on the north shore we did have a, a quite an amount of um, dairy uh, in years past historically there had been a large uh, CAFO contribution of dairy sources of fecal indicator bacteria to the watershed uh, but in the time since Hurricane Katrina, we've seen a, just a vast explosion of the population over there. People have been moving from the South Shore to the North Shore. And also, um, I guess the industry of smaller dairy sources has been on the decline. So there hasn't been as much in the way of contributions to the watershed as a result of those things. So, yes, I think to answer your question, it's, it's certainly. Uh, a, an increase in, in population in something that's that's not under the, the purview of the Clean Water Act. Okay, gotcha. So, I mean, other than that centralized uh, water treatment facility, what what else could could you do to fix the pollution issues down there? Well, uh, you know, I, I think it that's kind of an there's an interesting question that's that's maybe in the question you just asked. Um, certainly, we've been hearing uh, quite a bit about our carbon footprint and the energy that's required to pump water for both production and for treatment. Um, and certainly, that that conversation is going to be uh, ongoing for some time. 
the advantage with having an on-site well in a uh, wastewater treatment system is certainly you don't have to pump that water from one site to another and then to a to a third to be treated uh, for for disposal uh, and that's that's a distinct advantage you don't have that carbon footprint with those pumping costs but it it is a little bit of a challenge because you're losing i think some benefit with having uh, a certified operator to treat those waste streams sure and then what about um, PFAS? Are you seeing that? We haven't uh, actually started any kind of measuring activities with that, but that is a forever compound and it's been popping up all over the area. Um, I think it's certainly something we're, we're going to be looking toward for capturing data in the very near future. Gotcha. And I know it's everywhere, so you will have a challenge on your hands. And then what about microplastics? What are you seeing around those? So microplastics is a program that we've started and we started capturing or trying to capture data uh, with the assistance of, of community scientists. We did have interest of people wanting to help with capturing samples. Um, so that was a program that was started in uh, 2019. Uh, the microplastics project has been interesting. Um, you know, we try to collect every sample or piece of data um, and have quality assurance procedures around that data capture so that what we define as a number uh, in both units and, and and our measures is representative of the of the samples that we are collecting. So one of the challenges has been that microplastics is not yet incorporated into the gold standard of, of water assessment. Um, by the way of a, a book called Standard Methods for the Examination of Water and Wastewater. Um, but we're, we're really interested in the different types of, micro, of microplastics that are out in the vir environment. There's fibers, nurdles, films, um, and, and kind of various contributions or sources to those different particles. Uh, what we have seen, at least from the data that we have collected to date is that we have a lot of fibers in the water. And I think that's interesting um, because the, the theory is that maybe those, those waters are, are having fibers as a result of washing clothes uh, with having more synthetic fibers uh, in, our, in our everyday clothing attire. Uh, and then with having a, a lot of decentralized wastewater treatment, maybe that's the, the source or contribution uh, for those fibers appearing in the in the environment, but um, certainly an area, and it's and it's evolving science, and I think we're uh, we're really interested to see what we can learn from that. Oh, I bet that's interesting about the clothes, and does not surprise me. And I was going to ask you what can be done about it, but really, you're just starting to really study the data now, right? And and really, even beyond that, I think. I think the community to really understand what's going on. If, if, if you're discussing a measure of fecal coliform, uh, I think most people that are working in environmental sciences are of the understanding you have to capture that sample within six hours. And there's a positive control and a negative control that you need to run in your assessment. To, you know, there is a set protocol for that procedure. Um, the science is still evolving as far as microplastics. And the ways that we can analyze those samples, um, you know, our program we don't do a digestion with a strong acid or a peroxide to make sure there's no organics in it. So even before you kind of work out the data and figure out, um, you know, your trends or your your sources or your contributions, you really have to work out the methodology and the quality assurance behind any kind of measures that you're utilizing. And that's uh, that still needs to be teased out. Gotcha, okay, that makes sense. And then I know your organization does a lot of advocacy work. What, what types of things are you focusing on now? Well, so our, I guess as an organization, you know, what we would like to see is an environmentally sustainable uh, and resilient region. And the ways that we go about doing that, first and foremost, is to is to drive uh, stewardship in the in the area, and that's done by um, first scientific data capture or research, and then we perform different activities associated with education and advocacy. 
So we do try to exert a change that's driven based on some of the science that we do. So with your leading question, for instance, uh, we've looked at capturing data related to diversion projects. And uh, because we've seen that diversion projects are uh, very good land builders, we've been advocates and proponents for utilizing uh, those scale, those projects on much larger scales to restore the coast. And how important is that education piece of it? Well, I, I would like to, I would really like to say something wise and profound, but I can't. Uh, the education <laughs> piece is so critical to everything and everything that we do. Um, in a lot of cases, it seems like, like memory can be very short-sighted and, and you don't remember. Um, in the case of just a couple of years ago, uh, we had folks leaving the South Shore and going to the North Shore, but they didn't get an instruction manual or a, any kind of piece of information that goes along with maintaining on-site wastewater treatment systems. So there has been the challenge of um, they don't know what to do. Uh, some folks think that as long as their toilet is flushing, and it will flush even if the system isn't working, uh, everything's fine. So. A lot of what we do has to go into giving folks these different pieces of information. Well, you need air that's being blown from an aerator into your tank. You know, if you're if you're driving vehicles over this aerator line, that aerator line can break. There's a variety of different failure points in these systems. Um, so just just imparting information uh, is absolutely a requirement in just about everything, and and making sure that that our environment is protected. It's it's a critical component. Absolutely. And especially I'm sure you see behavior change when you you go into certain areas and and talk about it, especially since they are the overseers of their own facility, give or take, right? Their homes being their facility. It's crazy. Yeah, it 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 really is. Um, <laughs> it really is. And I mean, we've all seen Jackson, Mississippi, and I know you're on the other end of that, but do you think Louisiana has, has learned anything from that? Is there anything on the infrastructure side that um, the state or your region is doing as a result of something like that happening? I think there are, and I, I can't necessarily speak to these projects, but I think it is it's maybe a newer vision of the state or certainly with all the infrastructure funding, um, there are pod projects proposed that are going to capture um, regionalization a little bit better or, or improving of infrastructure. But all across Louisiana, we, we certainly have very decentralized uh, water treatment for both the potable side of things and the wastewater side of things. Um, and, and that's that's certainly a risk point in, in the future. You know, Louisiana is it's both blessed and cursed in this way. Uh, water is not something we usually have um, issues with quantity. Uh, sometimes we have you know very strong issues with water quality, but the water quantity we, we usually have bountiful supply. You know, uh, having all of those facilities up and down the Mississippi River that are trying to produce something and they are taking water to either for cooling water or for process water and then disposing of it back into the Mississippi River. You know, that's that's um, a very abundant resource that we don't get in other areas of the country, particularly out west. So. I, I guess to your point or to your question. Um, Regionalization is is going to be important, and in, in, in reinvesting in those uh, infrastructure pieces are really going to be critical to kind of protect water quality and water quantity into the future. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I would see that you guys would not have a problem with quantity down there. We haven't, but like I said earlier, uh, we haven't gotten rain in a month, and it is exceptionally dry. Oh, true. I usually, so I set up a rain barrel at my house, um, just personally, 
And it was more to kind of protect the back corner of my lot from having rainwater go into an area that doesn't have a, a, a very good drain. Uh, and I've, I've used that 55 gallon barrel to, to water plants. Uh, it is bone dry and has been for some time, which it, it's never done in the two years that I've had it there. Um, it's just, we have not had rain in so long and I've used all that water that I've stored that I'm now having to use potable water from the city of New Orleans to try to keep things from totally dying, which is just, uh, it's not something we usually have to worry about. We usually have adequate rainfall. Oh, wow. Well. Are you expected to get some soon? I've, I've got one of those notifications on my watch uh, not too long ago. There is no rain in the forecast for the next 10 days. Oh, wow. Yeah. And everyone worries about the quality of their drinking water, right? I mean, that's I'm in Connecticut. I'm always concerned about it. Uh, how much do the filters work? For the everyday person who really does not have your scientific background, what would you look for, or tell people to, to consider um, in drinking water, whether it's bottled water, it's out of the tap? What are things to consider and, and hopefully look for in order to I mean, I know you can never 100% guarantee, but to drink the safest water possible. Ooh, I might give a slightly, um, I might give you an opinion that's not very popular. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. Well, so I'm, I'm a very big proponent of tap water. Um, you know, tap water, when you think of production of that tap water, uh, and the professional operators and utilities that usually are you know, associated with these facilities. Uh, I'll speak a little bit on the side about some that are unfortunately not, but tap water is produced uh, because of the Safe Drinking Water Act. There is a annual report that you can go and look at the quality of your water from your uh, public utility. It uh, is usually of a great quality and um, the cost per unit of that water is certainly much cheaper than when you compare it to bottled water, and it doesn't produce the same level of waste as bottled water. So I am I'm very much a, a proponent of tap water. Um, there are some folks that are on wells that are just not connected to a municipal system. Um, well water is good. It's great. Uh, you do have some issues in areas where you have large industrial users of groundwater that can be problematic because they may, like in Baton Rouge, for instance, there are uh, several industrial users of groundwater that have such demand that there is some infiltration on the south side of the city of salt water into the freshwater aquifer, and that is uh, certainly a concern. And then in some cases, I do know of uh, some small uh, production facilities, or, or really they're more neighborhoods, um, but there are small operators that produce water for different neighborhoods uh, that, that certainly have issues with providing a, a sufficient or a, a adequate water quality uh, for those homes. Um, so it's, it's not without risk, but I, I definitely think that tap water is the way to go. And it uh, has some very clear benefits over to bottled water. Um, and, it, and it is kind of interesting. There's certainly science uh, around um, the leaching of different plasticizers into bottled water uh, that, that there can be some hidden risks there uh, related to, to exposure to those plasticizers. So uh, nothing is perfect. And uh, all waters will carry you know, some level of, of there's nothing pure, so there will be some level of contamination of water, uh, and you just kind of have to understand the pros and cons of of different sources and and make the decision that's best for you. But I do like tap water. That does not surprise me. I feel like that's um, as a scientist, that would be the answer I would expect. <laughs> and that's that's a big thing for me, given that our our tap water ultimately comes from the Mississippi River, so we have. Uh, you know, uses all up and down two thirds of the continental U.S. where people are utilizing it and then putting it back in after 
after having used it, whether it's sanitary in nature or industrial in nature. Sure. It's delicious. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, Brady, I know you're aiming to have a more sustainable water quality and, and systems in Louisiana. What does that look like to you? What would be a, a perfect mix for you? And, and how will you get there or at least strive to? Well, kind of, I guess, like I mentioned, um, one of the things I think is regionalization of, of our water infrastructure having a a professional set of operators that are treating those water sources, whether they're sanitary wastewater or potable drinking water sources, and are ultimately responsible. Um, Because, you know, you do have teeth under the Clean Water Act if if something happens at a plant and, and you have a sanitary sewer overflow or water is discharged from the plant that doesn't meet your permit. Um, But getting folks out of the, the private as it were, business of, of supplying their families for both potable water and um, sanitary wastewater are, are certainly some things that, that I would personally like to see. Now, there's a, there's a cost benefit to all these things. And in the most rural areas, it doesn't make sense necessarily to tie those folks in. But where you have areas of rapid urban development like we do uh, in Covington, Louisiana or Mandeville, Louisiana, It certainly makes sense to have folks tied into some kind of water or wastewater infrastructure. Oh, yeah, that does make sense. How long do you think it will take you to get there? (laughs) I don't I don't know. That's a a very, very long time. I'm sure. Well, and, you know, with good reason Um, for homes that have already been built. uh, And I know you mentioned Connecticut. Do you are you tied into a wastewater treatment system? Do you know? We are. Okay. So you have a, you get a monthly bill for your, for your sewer, sewer disposal fee or yep. uh, volume to sewer or some kind of fee like that. Yes. Uh, do, do you know how many people in Connecticut may have an on-site wastewater treatment system, like a septic tank or an ATU? Oh, good question. I'm not sure the percentage I would imagine, at least in my town, it's pretty high because of, obviously the ones closer to town um but there we have a lot of sort of hillier areas that will be tied into septic not uh to city so i would have to look that's a good question well so the first place to start i think with that vision and and what it looks like as far as bringing that message to folks is uh, the first thing you have to do is to assess some kind of economic mechanism to tie those folks in, right? It does come at some cost to connect homes that are already built to infrastructure, whether they have to run a sewer line out to that home, but you're digging up a street. Um, You may have pumps if you're going against the direction of gravity. There's all kinds of fun things that go into that equation. And that's, that's just the first place to start as far as it's going to come at a cost. Oh, yeah, of course. That makes sense. But in Louisiana, uh, all of our on-site wastewater treatment systems uh, usually discharge to a ditch in the front of the house. Uh, Our soils are very compact and they're very organic and they don't drain as well as as some softer sands or, or other geologic formations. So we discharge our wastewater to a ditch in the front yard um and there's a variety of concerns that come along with that if if the wastewater treatment system isn't performing the sewer treatment is happening in the ditch uh that ultimately makes its way to you know different bayous and tributaries going into lake pontchartrain and that's ultimately how we've gotten involved um but the neighborhoods we work with different partners um the neighborhoods that we've noticed a lot of these treatment strategies um, that utilize these ATU systems, they have high occurrences with West Nile uh, virus. So um, the mosquito that that likes to propagate that that disease happens to like highly polluted ditches. Um, So there's a hidden health cost that's also kind of buried in there. Um, Our folks adversely or um, 
are they are they possibly exposed to West Nile virus, and therefore, um, you know, is that a, a hidden health cost to them as a result of this practice? Oh yeah, you're right. I didn't even think of that. Interesting. There's so much so to it, consider around water, Brady. My goodness. There really is, um, and there's so many things that uh, you know, we touch and, and we utilize, but we don't even think. I mean, uh, my son is. 10 years old and um you know it, it one day it didn't even it didn't even dawn on me but he was just thinking well it goes down the sink when i when i turn off the water it just goes down the sink well where where does the rest of that go right i, I don't know dad i've never really thought about that <laughs> so true and most people don't think of it until they turn it on and it's uh, either discolored or it doesn't work right i mean that's how we all think about it for the most part. Well, yeah, and, and you know, water quality is, there are a great set of tools that water quality has. Um, there are some fantastic measures. We can talk BOD and COD and some things that are, are fantastic measures for water quality, but they don't necessarily make a great impact with folks when you're just talking about what that means. Um, you really have to get into something that is, uh, I think, quite risky or scary to to fathom, like West Nile virus, for instance, or or mosquitoes. Nobody enjoys those. You really have to have a strong odor or or color or some kind of visual disturbance to the water to really kind of register an impact with folks. Absolutely, I think we see that every day. Well, this has been fascinating. I feel like this has been like a water quality 101 session. Um, you really gave great insight into all of it. Is there anything else you want to share, Brady? Well, for your listeners that are interested in our organization and what we do, we we um, we have our our website is scienceforourcoast.org. Um, we recently developed an app and released our data to the public. Um, or released through that mechanism. Um, so you can download on either iOS or Android our application and it presents our data. So certainly if you're visiting the New Orleans area, it's a it's a great um, useful tool to have. Oh, that is. Thank you. Well, I will certainly be checking out your organization and um, appreciate all the hard work you're doing to make a more sustainable uh, waterway. Yeah, look forward. Hopefully I get the chance to meet you in person and Hopefully the weather is nice for you. Oh, thank you. Yes. And I hope you get some rain. Just enough. <laughs> Not too much. Just enough. enough. Right. <laughs> exactly. Oh, well, thanks, Brady. Thank you for your time. I really do appreciate being invited on.